Okay, we're going to talk about measuring instruments. We're going to talk about a bunch of them. And actually, we're going to talk about a couple that are not in the book. And that doesn't mean that you don't have to know about them, uh, because you do. Um, the book wants to talk about a D'Arsonval movement. You'll need to know about that for one day. How to connect a voltmeter. You already know that a voltmeter is connected in parallel, because in parallel, all the voltages are the same, right? So if you connect in parallel, ammeter, you break into the circuit so you get into series. Analog meters are characterized by the fact that they use a pointer and a scale to indicate their value, uh, which is not quite true. I mean, I want to kind of disagree with a couple of definitions, like analog. Okay, the world is analog. Things happen in full waves, in full sound, in waves of light, waves of everything, and it's all analog. It's what really happens. If you want to talk about a digital anything, some device has made some decisions to create a digital duplicate of what's happening, basically. Anytime you have a digital meter or a digital anything, it starts off with an analog signal that it is taking information from and making it digital. Okay? So let's go to the next slide. And here we have a Diarzenval movement, and it's got a big, what is that thing? Magnetic coil. And a moving coil and a pointer. Pretty simple stuff. Uh, with a rectifier to change AC voltage to DC. And why is that? Because this, this movement won't do anything with the AC. It needs DC to move. Okay. A voltmeter. We know what a voltmeter is. Designed to be connected directly across the source of power. Directly in parallel with whatever you're trying to read. Uh, analog meter is similar to reading a speedometer or a fuel gauge. Now that's true, and I want you to think about, let's talk about your fuel gauge. How does the, how does the circuit get the information of how full your tank is? With a floating device, right? And it has a pointer that goes up and down, and creates more or less resistance or more or less impedance or more or less something, right? And it takes that information as an analog signal up to some digital piece of equipment, and that's interpreted into digital after it's being translated to digital, as it were. Okay. Ammeters use or read current must be connected in series. Now that's an inline ammeter, meaning you're going to break into the line. An inline ammeter, because there's another one we're going to talk about momentarily. Okay. Now some meters have a shunt built in. You should not look at that as uh, like that because a shunt extends the measurement range of a meter. Now this is a clamp-on meter, and this is a Hall effect meter. Hall was a guy that was here in America, John Hopkins University, discovered the Hall effect, which is named after him, and you can tell, you in, can infer the amount of current going through the loop of the Hall effect meter. Now what if, we've talked about sometimes a voltmeter will not split an ohm, right? Sometimes they won't because they're not sensitive enough to be able to sense less than a full ohm. What about an ammeter? How small of an amp, how many amps has an ammeter got to have to be able to read? Some are sensitive, some are not very sensitive. Let's say that this clamp-on ammeter was really intended to read 10 
to 400 amps. It's going to have trouble with anything below 10. And if we know we're trying to read something that's around 2, what we can do is we can take this wire, and what happens if we wrap this wire around this clamp? We multiply the reading, okay? If we wrap it five times around there, and it's 2 amps, or right about, we know that it's somewhere above 2 amps. So if we wrap it five times, we're going to have what? somewhere above 10 amps, which is above the bottom end of the meter, so it's something it can now read. So now you want to know why you might want to wrap a wire around the clamp on ammeter to extend its range down. Okay. Okay, ohm meter is used to measure resistance. And there are two basic types, an analog or a digital. They're both really analog, but one has a digital readout only. Okay. Of course, I'm sure some meter makers will disagree, but that's okay. Uh, digital meters display the resistance in figures instead of using a meter. Now, there are times when an analog meter is really, really necessary. There's a thing called the kick, kick test where you're trying to find the polarity of a transformer winding. You need an analog meter with an analog readout to be able to see the kick. There are times when you're working with motors and you want to find the polarity of a winding and you want to spin it to see what happens. The only meter that will do you any good is an analog meter. A digital meter will not show you that kick. Okay. Digital ohmmeters. By the way, with any kind of ohmmeter, what would should we never try and measure? An energized circuit. If a, a ohmmeter works by sending out a maximum of 9 volts and seeing what comes back. And that difference is a ratio, which is the Resistance, right? The number of ohms. And because of that, if there's other voltage on it and you connect it to it, you may destroy it. Now that's okay as long as it's your meter. And because of that, in the second semester, we insist that you buy a slightly more expensive, a lot more expensive meter than you really need. We insist that you buy, for your digital multimeter, we insist you buy a fluke. 117 because it's got two fuses in it. So you may buy a fuse, but you don't have to buy a meter. <laughs> All right? Vastly advantageous, depending on the cost of your meter, of course. If you're talking about a $5 uh, Radio Shack meter, it's so inaccurate, it's probably not going to even do you any good in the lab, but uh, it's a smaller loss than a fuse sometimes, but that's a whole different thing. Okay. Uh, low impedance voltage tester has a very large current draw. So what does that mean? Don't use a low impedance meter on certain kinds of circuits because it might do some damage. Okay. Low impedance voltage tester. Let's see. Oh, a wiggy. A low impedance voltage tester is sometimes known as a solenoid type. It's not known as a solenoid type. It's called a Wigington, and most people call it a wiggy. Now, you most IBEW electricians will have what's called a wiggy to test very simply if you've got 110, 220, 480, and that's all it will tell you. But it pulls in a solenoid and it pulls it down farther and farther the higher the voltage. Well, that's really cool, but imagine that you connect it to 4180 instead of 480, and that solenoid is suddenly motivated to fly towards you at, oh, say, about 300 miles an hour. Okay? That's happened a lot of times. That's how we know what happens when you connect it to 4180. We know 
what happens because people have done it. Not something you should ever do. So one of the things that you should know about a Wigginton is never point the solenoid at you when you're taking a measurement. Always point it at your partner or something other than you. Anything but you. Okay? Because if it shoots the solenoid out at 300 miles an hour, it's like being hit by a shotgun shell that's got a slug that's an inch and a half across. It does some serious damage. Okay? Why do they still use that? Because it definitely tells you that the voltage really is this, and ghost voltages don't show up on a Wigginton. They only show up on a digital multimeter. Okay? And actually, the Fluke 117, one of its advantages, it has a way to check for ghost voltages and eliminate them. All right. Lone Pins Voltage Tester. Uh, ground paths can produce misleading voltages. Ground paths produce what are called ghost voltages. Okay. Reading a digital meter. Nice and easy. It just tells you what it says. Don't tell me that's just going to be the whole thing. Okay. Well, that's fine. We're going to stop and we're going to look at a blank screen for a little while. And we're going to talk about some other things. Actually, hang on one second. I need to open the book. Okay, we need to talk a couple about talk about a couple more meters. Uh, this is an analog uh, VOMM volt ohm milliammeter. Um, a volt ohm milliammeter only reads milliamps, parts of an amp, very small parts of an amp. It's not intended to read whole amps, so it reads voltage, resistance or small amounts of current. And it's a great meter. Uh, just not that long ago on the last troubleshooting job I was doing for the biggest electrical company in the northern area, um, one of the things they supplied in the truck for me was a Fluke analog meter, I mean a Fluke digital meter, and a Simpson 260. And they're both necessary to doing troubleshooting because this will do things that other meters will not. Very accurate meter, and it's very tricky to use. And the 116, the Electrical Construction and Maintenance 116 class, we go over a lot of how to use this meter because it's an essential piece of information. Uh, there, in the second semester, there's a project where you need to use this meter, and you know need to know how to use it before you walk in the class. So it's a pretty important thing to know. So a Simpson 260 is very important in uh, this school, at least. Let's go forward. This is the Wigginton voltage meter I was talking about. And um, those little solenoid pops up at the very top. And so you want to be very careful where you point this thing when you're measuring voltage, just in case you just happen to read 4180 instead of 480. Oh, also, if you do measure 4180, there'll be this ball of flame that will come out of where you just created an arc called an arc flash. It'll burn every piece of skin that's exposed. And uh, so you will, uh, it will be obvious to everyone, wh whether you have your gloves on or your safety glasses on or your hard hat on, uh, years later because you'll have burned skin everywhere you didn't have any of that stuff on. Okay, now if you're going to touch a meter uh, panel, you've got to wear an arc flash suit because a lot of people have been injured using this kind of equipment. I was an expert witness in a case where a guy took a... Um, uh, he was trying to take a breaker out of a, a, a just a 483 phase panel, but it was served directly by a 1500 amp set of three phase breakers, three phase fuses, I'm sorry, which take even longer to, to um, and he arced it across and it set him on fire from his waist up. And we know that because you, we can see the, um, the security video as he's running down the hallway on fire. And that because of that, everyone that touches a live panel now has to wear an arc flash suit. So here we have that clamp on ammeter. And you can see how it's got a very handy use here. We're reading a wire 
and we're not taking the wire out, we're not disconnecting anything, we're just clamping it around and we're getting a reading. So it's a really handy piece of equipment and uh, it's very useful. And they actually come in different ranges for certain amounts of, like this is, you're going to expect a small amount of current here. Certainly not get over 400 amps. Right there it's only 12.27 amps. Now this is an oscilloscope. Actually this is just the face of an oscilloscope. And none of these are sine waves, which is what we expect with AC power. Matter of fact, this is called a square wave, which means you're getting DC power coming off and going on and coming off and going on and coming off and going on. And this is a very modified sine wave. Something's very, very wrong with this voltage. Okay. Now, the thing you need to know about an oscilloscope is basically a pictorial voltage meter. All it does is show you a picture of one part of one second of the voltage. What is it doing during a whole second? How is the voltage changing instantaneously as time goes by? You can see a picture of it, so that's the purpose of an oscilloscope. Here we have a megger, and what it does is it reads very large amounts of resistance. Meg ohms is what it reads. Meg ohms. How many is a meg? Kilo, mega, thousand, million. So it's reading millions of ohms. So if you wanted to read the resistance of a ground rod to another ground rod, you could use a mega, right? Probably. Possibly. That's one of the old ways we would check to see the resistance between a pair of ground rods. Okay, so a megger, another thing you need to know about a megger is it's not destructive. It does operate at 500 volts or something around there sometimes, but that's okay. It's not destructive because anything you're going to be looking at is going to be rated for 500 or 600 volts. The wire will be rated for 600 volts, and you can change its setting down to 250 volts if you're going to be checking 300-volt wires because there are 300-volt wires. So it can see a very small leakage, as it were, that's going back to ground. So if you read the wire going out and the ground, if you see some resistance, you know that there's some leakage going on, right? But it's at such a low voltage, it's probably not going to create much of a leakage. So it probably won't see it if you've got a high voltage leak. The thing that will see that leak when you're talking about a high voltage leak you need to know when you're putting in a circuit that's 25,000 volts if you have just a pinhole in the insulation that's near a piece of metal that's grounded really well what's going to happen it's like having a, a garden hose that's hooked up to a fire hose that only has a little tiny pinhole in it not very long before that pinhole becomes a big rip right it's going to destroy itself, right? But we don't want that to happen. That's called a big short. And when we pull in high voltage wires, we hate to have a big short. So what we'll do is we will check it with a high pot or high potential or high voltage tester, a high pot tester. Now the bad news is that this is a destructive tester. It can be test. It can be. It not necessarily is, but it can be operated at such high voltage that it's destroying the insulation as you're working on it. Now, remember we talked about the little pinhole in the insulation? This thing will turn that pin, little pinhole into a rip also. Not as much, but it's going to be operating at high enough voltage that it might damage the pinhole that it already is a problem. But it will at least let you know that you've got that pinhole and you can't use that for energized high voltage conductor. So high pot tester is very important to linemen that are going to test the wires before they're going to energize them, especially if you're going to energize them at very high voltages and you're depending on the insulation preventing the voltage from getting out. And that's kind of the job of an electrician, to keep the voltage inside the wire. Okay? So the high pot tester it can be a destructive tool but used properly, it's not destructive, and it only tells you it's only destructive when there's already a problem, okay? 
So a high pot tester. Now this one has a crank. The more modern ones have a battery. I don't like the modern ones. Okay. Because if you forget to turn it off before you do anything and drain off all its little capacitors inside and you just happen to touch the wrong part, it will knock the hell out of you and the battery type will keep knocking the hell out of you, which is not a good thing. Now it's very destructive tester. Okay. So I don't like the battery type. You can tell why I have touched the wrong part at the wrong time with almost everything. So when I did this, I didn't like it. Now, you can get shocked from a crank high pot tester because it stores some energy in different parts. So keep in mind that until you know for sure that it has no energy in it, don't touch the probes. Okay. This is a little old watt meter. We've talked about watts and VAs being different things sometimes. The nice thing about a watt meter is it only measures true power. So let's say that you had a circuit that was producing 70% true power. You could tell that from the incoming voltage and current is your apparent power, and your true power would only be measured by the watt meter. So if I were to give you a watt meter reading, and the VA reading, or the incoming voltage and incoming current, and ask you what is the efficiency of this circuit, you could figure that out because efficiency is just output over input, right? And input is VAs, and output is wattage, right? Ah, so, so this is a pretty handy thing to have. This is obviously a really old one, and by the way, it has four connections two for the voltage, and two for the current. Now, they also come in a clamp-on type that clamps onto the wire, and you can find those also, but this is not one of those. This is an inline type. And I think that's it.